Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us. This is our Improve Your IELTS Speaking Score webinar. Uh, joining us for the second time in webinar series history, uh, but for the first time as host is IELTS expert Rochelle van der Moeer, uh, who is here to discuss everything you'll need to know about the speaking test section. Yeah, um, we'll cover everything from question types and tasks to what exactly examiners look for when they're scoring your test, um, as well as covering some common myths and misconceptions. Uh, we'll finish with about 15 minutes uh, worth of questions uh, where Rochelle will provide some answers. Uh, so make sure you're asking your questions in the comments uh, or tag a friend who might have some questions for us about IELTS speaking. Uh, without further ado, I'm super happy to hand over to you, Rochelle. Hello and welcome. Hello, Dave. Thank you, Sam. So hello everybody, um, as you heard my name is Rochelle and I've been with IDP for 12 years so um, I am very happy to work as an IELTS speaking coach and expert um, at IDP and I hope that I can share some of what I've learned through all these years with you to help you improve your test score. Alright, so um, now we will um, look at, so we will be looking at um, how to gain some practical speaking tips and we'll also talk about um, how you'll be scored so you can understand how these band descriptors work and then also on how to avoid costly mistakes. So First of all, what's very unique to IDP is that we have, you can choose between academic or general training. Um, and now that you have these choices, um, you don't always have a choice, but if you do have a choice, you probably wonder which one you need to take. Most of you have probably taken the academic test. And the academic test is usually when you want to go and study, um, get a visa to study somewhere. But if you are, um, if you do have the choice, then, for example, if you choose the general training, that's usually a good choice if you are in a job like IT or engineering where you work a lot with numbers, but you want to you want to show your English literary literacy skills. So a good way to show that would to, to you would be able to choose general training um, because in there you when you choose general you'll be able to show your literacy show your vocabulary skills your literacy skills um, better. Okay, so. Um, also, this seminar will focus on um, test takers who already have some sort of good base in English and will look at um, scores from six and above. Now, um, okay. So if you just bear with me, I'll just wait for this. So ideally you need to practice your English every day. Now, um, when we look at the speaking test, some people ask, what is the difference between the academic and the general for a speaking test? Well, the good news is there's no difference, no difference in the speaking test for whether you're doing general or academic. It's the same. You don't have to change the way you are doing it for the speaking. It is exactly the same, the same times and the same format. Now, I just hope you can see this clearly because let me just double check something. I think because my screen was acting up a little bit. Thank you for bearing with me. So, um, with our speaking test, it is face to face. Okay, so you get to do this face to face with your examiner. And whether it's computer based, your test, or whether it's Paper-based, you still see the examiner face-to-face. -face. In Melbourne, where we had the pandemic um, and we're still dealing with opening times and less restrictions, um, at the moment, we are still doing it via Zoom. The person, the test taker, goes into the office. Um, you will go in there to the test room. Everything will be set up for you, but the examiner would be on a Zoom screen just to minimize contact. But 
it will slowly open up again. So for now, just know that it will still be with a human being. And the advantage of that is that computers cannot read anxiety really well. If you are nervous or anxious, that's why you need a human, um, such as the examiner, to just take you through this. Now, there are three parts. Parts one and two would all be me, 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 me. It will all be about you. And part three would be general. So when we ask you any questions in part three, ideally, we want to see whether you can have a two-way conversation, but it will, it, we will test how generally you can speak. Think about it like, um, like a philosophy class. You will sit there and if you can only use very basic English, you will be saying things like, my favorite food is chocolate. But the more generally you can speak, the broader your range of language, right? So that's what we'll be testing as well. So just go with that in part three. Part one is just very basic questions about what food you like, where do you live, all sorts of general straightforward questions like that. We just want to see if you can share some basic information and and try to tell us why you like things or why you don't like things. You don't have to go into a lot of detail, but it truly does help just to share a bit about that in part one. And in part two, we'll give you a topic. And that is just to see whether you can prepare a short presentation, um, just a short little talk with us. Um, so that's what part two is about. And part three, we'll go deeper into what you were talking about, but in a generalized way. So yes, this is just to check your English speaking skills in a conversational manner. Okay, and overall, um, it will be 11 to 14 minutes. And you don't have to worry about the times in each part. We will be keeping the time. All you need to do is show up. We'll give you the pen, the paper, and we will do the time. We might rush you sometimes. We might interrupt you. Don't panic about that. Please don't. That is just us getting you through it. Because if you speak too much, you might get mentally exhausted. And if you speak too little, we won't get enough language. So our job is just to get you through this. So we might interrupt you here and there. It's not because you've done anything wrong. Okay. So now um, we are going to just talk about how we assess you. Okay, so as you can see, I've got my little promptly little promptly little copy here, but you should all have this in your packs. It's the speaking assessment criteria. And it's actually very simple. Um, what we basically when you book a coaching session, for example, um, I can actually tell you exactly which parts apply to you and which parts not. But you can try and do this at home as well. Um, so we have four parts. It's divided into four parts. One, two, three, four. That is how we assess you, all right? And we have to give you a score out of nine for each of these four parts. So, um, and then we take those four scores and we mush them together, basically, we have to give you the average of those four scores and that will be your final speaking score. Um, but it's not 100% mathematical because this is still a language-based test. So for example, if you get um, a 6666, six, 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 you'll be a six. If you get a 6667, six, six, you'll still be a six. If you get a 6677, six, seven, you'll be a 6.5. If you get a 6777, Mathematically, you should average out to a seven now, but because this is a language test, you will still be a 6.5. The only way to get a round number, a nice round number, is to either get all sevens or get an eight somewhere if you're getting a six somewhere. So for example, eight, seven, seven, six, then that eight would compensate for that little six down there and it will all average out to a seven. And that's how it works for most things. So your strengths are actually in some ways sometimes more important than your weaknesses. You don't see an athlete use their bad arm or their bad leg. They all use their best arm and their best leg um, in the competition. 
And that's what we need you to do. Okay, so, oh my goodness, now this. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how you will be scored. Just as I said, we'll be looking at your 25% of, um, of your score will be fluency and coherence. Fluency is how do you speak too fast? Do you speak too slow? Um, do you, or do you speak like a car that's stopping and starting, stopping and starting? Or do you speak at a nice even speed? Like I hopefully am right now, <laughs> but that's what I mean. So we just want you to speak at a nice even speed, but it doesn't help, you know, you, you're speaking at this nice even speed, but you're making no sense. You have to make sense. You have to stick to the point, um, keep us on board. So that's where coherence comes in. You need to be able to make sense. If you are not coherent and you're not making sense, that could affect your point quite badly. So we need you to be fluent. And how do you make things fluent? You use words like and, so, because. Um, and if you only say and, so, and because, that's quite limited. But if you can use a wide range of, if you look at, for example, in a sick, I mean, six on the fluency and coherence if you do have your notes handy you'll see in the second point of the six it says uses a range of connectives and discourse markers and that's what those things are little fillers and so okay that those sorts of things please don't say anything like um what you call that or something just say oh, i can't think of the word or to give me a bit of time, but just make sure you're using correct English for this. Um, then another part of the score will be your lexical resource. That is um, vocabulary. Um, so how many words in English do you know? So for a six, we need you to speak about familiar and unfamiliar topics with ease. You don't want to struggle there. And then for a seven, we need you to show us some fancy language, okay, and hopefully an idiom or two. Um, and then for an eight, we need you to really show us some fancy language, some more sophisticated language. I'm making this very simple in the way I'm explaining, but we need some really um, sophisticated language for an eight. Um, and if you look at a seven, um, the third point under lexical resource, in a seven, it says generally, paraphrases successfully. Paraphrases, if you don't know how to say something in English, but you want to say, you still want to say it, um, but you may be saying it in a clumsier way or a more poetic way, it's okay. You're allowed to get creative as long as we understand what you mean. So for a seven, you can paraphrase as long as you use sophisticated language as well, a good mix. But for an eight, less paraphrasing, more sophisticated language, okay? And in the nine, they don't even mention paraphrasing. So um, now grammatical range and accuracy is another part of your score. And that is basically, do you use more than one tense? Please use a few tenses and that's good. That's different forms, right? And then complicated, complex structures. Um, that is, for example, I like your dog, present tense, but, it did bark at me this morning. Two different tenses put together in a complicated way. Or what if we went to the shop but did not buy anything? It's just these ways of putting things together. If you can do those basic things, that's a six and above. And if you make maybe a hundred million mistakes, but we you're not you're not confusing us regarding where you are in time or changing the meaning too much with your mistakes. It can be a six and above, but if you make like a hundred thousand mistakes, obviously not exactly, but if you make less mistakes, we're looking more at a seven and an eight is a different kind of thing altogether. We don't want you to repeat the same mistakes again and again in an eight, right? So, but you're still allowed to make some mistakes, um, even for a nine, but we'll get into more detail about that later. And then finally, pronunciation. Pronunciation is really influenced a lot by fluency. There are some features that are influenced by fluency. If you're not very fluent, it will affect things like rhythm. It will affect things like word grouping, but we'll get into more detail. Pronunciation is how clearly you are speaking. 
um, with, and also your accent can be a, um, a factor as well, as long as we can understand what you are saying. It doesn't matter if you have a strong accent, you can have a very strong South African accent, which is where I am from, by the way. English is my second language, so I understand what it's like learning a different language. But as long as we understand what you are saying, your native tongue is not distorting what you are saying. We are listening with an international ear. Accents are welcome, right? Okay, now let's listen to this person. We're going to listen to this person um, just to kind of hear, and then we'll discuss the details, okay? And this, hopefully this video is going to work. Now, we've been talking about a well-known person you like or admire, and I'd like to discuss with you one or two more general questions sure. related to this. Let's consider, first of all, famous people in your country. Yep. So in China, what kind of people become famous? Politicians, the pop stars, and, you know, sports stars. It's similar with the other countries, I think. Is one of those groups more popular than others? Uh, it depends, because for... Like politicians, you have to know them because they appeared all the time on the televisions or newspapers. But for some pop stars, like, cause it's especially famous for the young people, cause you know the young people like you know to follow the stars and the new trends. But for sports stars, they mainly become famous during you know some Olympic games or some competitions. So it really depends. Yeah. What about in the past? Were those same people famous in the past? Politicians, sports stars, and pop stars? I think so, cause even in the sorry, I have talked with my parents at their age, and when they was young, they also you know follow some pop stars and the sports stars, and you know for the politicians, you know they change out change quite often. So yeah, they're also famous. Yeah. And how about the future? Where do you think it's going to go? Um, I think is it. I mean, I mean, this kind of people will remain famous in the future, this type of people, because, you know, we still have lots of new pop stars, sports stars, and some new politicians. But I think some other people will join them as well. For example, notice, we, you know, some, like, entrepreneurs. For example, the founder of the Facebook, he's famous for everyone. Even, you know, the, some, you know, some, not weird, but strange people like the founder of the v Vicky Vick. You know, he's also popular because the things has done. So I think this kind of new... You know, a raising group of people will join you know, the famous people in the future. And do you think technology is going to be the place where many of our famous people come from in the future? Uh, definitely, because I think, you know, notice, you know, most of people use, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters, you know. So definitely this kind, of this kind of website or the new technology will help to, you know, make people famous. And I think many people are working on it because, you know, they are special companies, you know, to make these people famous through the internet, you know, the, you know, the advertisement or the promotion. Yeah. Now let's talk about celebrity culture. Often famous people are used in advertising. Yep. Can you give me some examples of that? Well, it's quite often, you know, we can see lots of famous people on the television. For example, like, one of the typical example is the Michael Jordan, because he is actually, you know, when the first time the Nike become very famous, it's because Michael Jordan, because he is the first, you know, he's the first NBA star, so, you know, to sign a company to, you know, have the, you know, f serious f commercials for specific companies. And I think that's a typical example, you know, how the famous people to make, to help the company successful and also the company use his money to make the stars become more famous. So I think it's, yeah. And that example you're talking about with Michael Jordan, he's a basketball player yep. who is promoting a product that he was personally involved yep. in, in producing. Yep. What about celebrities who endorse products for which they have no personal connection? Yeah, it's quite often because you know people are profit oriented. Because <laughs> yeah, we can see lots. I think for some like makeup production, we can see lots of females, you know, female stars. They just say, okay, this one's so good, it's fantastic. Nobody know whether he's, she has used it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes it depends on ethnic. This is ethnic choice. Some why they really ch try it and use it and then say, okay, this one's fine, it's good. So we can rely on it. But some of them just you know want to get the money. So. Is yeah, just you know, do the promotion stuff without really using it or you know, testing it. 
Now, how about our young people? How might famous people or celebrities have a negative impact on our young people? Well, as we know, some of famous people is not that you know good. I have to say, it's, I cannot say that immoral, but. The actions they have done is really bad. You know, the example for the young, 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 young kids or the young, young, young generation. Because you know, some of them, some of them, once they come the famous, they just try the drugs. You know, have you know, stay in the clubs. You know, all, the, all day, uh, not all day, but all the night. And uh, yeah, definitely, you know, young people sometimes cannot distinguish good things or the bad things. Sometimes they just follow the star's actions. So it makes you know. Some of them just okay say it. it's pretty cool thing you know to try some drug because that star is trying it and or many stars are trying it. Oh, it's pretty cool you know to stay with girls all the time, different girls all the time. You know some of my you know Edel his you know Edel he's doing the same thing. So I think it's pretty bad negative effects on the young people. Well, thank you very much. You. That's the end of the speaking test. Thanks. All right. So um, just speak with me. Okay, so let's see what Brian did here. Okay, so he's a six. Let's see why we are saying he's a six. So first, let's look at his fluency and coherence. He gives us extended responses. That's great. You know, that's if you look at next um, fluency and you look at a six, the basic requirement for a six is is willing to speak at length. Okay, so that's great. We don't have to beg him to give us some language. He is doing that. Um, He's got a reasonable range of linking words. You know, he says things like, for example, actually, as a result. Then he also uses grammatical constructions well to introduce ideas. He says, by having a hobby, by doing sports. So that's good stuff. But he is not always making sense. Sometimes it feels like I'm doing a lot of work just to follow him. He's um, got a bit of a lack of coherence because of hesitation and repetition. Um, and he overuses some of these fillers. He says, well, like, cause, yeah. And we'll get back to the words, yeah. Okay, a, little, a popular one, yeah. Now, lexical resource. Um, his range is enough to discuss topics at length, right? He can talk about familiar and unfamiliar topics, which is a basic requirement for six. He does that with ease. Um, and okay, he's using some less common expressions and collocation, um, for example, get on very well with each other. You know what I meant with fancy language and, um, and sophisticated language. And um, he says, increase money for charity, good for community, develop country psychologically, physically. So that's good. He's using some unusual words, nice words. But he is sometimes unaware of register or style. He uses two informal um, words like gone, wanna, and remember what I mentioned here? Now, when you are speaking with the examiner, we don't want you to do it like a job interview or a news reader or something like that, not too formal. We are still seeing how you would go in conversational English and how well you can express yourself in English. That is the point of this test. We need to see if you'll be able to deal with being in an English speaking country. The kind of English we want you to use should be applicable to an audience of, that would consist of people from 16 years old to 90 years old. So you can't get out all your swear words and your you know, very casual language there, but you also can't go too formal. You have to use a kind of English that would keep a lot of doors open, okay? so. We can't go too casual over here, and he may have done that a bit. All right, so let's look at grammatical range and accuracy. Now, he does use a range of um, structures, and then he uses simple and complex sentence forms. But when he uses complex sentences, he does make quite a lot of mistakes, a lot. <laughs> so he would say, they just want to get big car, big house, and that's the reason that forces them to work very hard than before. But the meaning is clear. We are not lost. We are not getting lost with what he's doing. So that keeps him in a six, all right? Otherwise, if we, if he did lose us on that, the meaning, then we probably would have been fine. Pronunciation is generally clear. Um, he uses some stress and 
intonation. He does not speak like a robot. And it does not sound like he's shouting all the time. He's, you know, sound, he, he's using some nice intonation. But unfortunately, there's a general, generally there's a bit of a flat intonation as well. Um, and the rhythm um, is a bit mechanical. I think it's part of his, if you listen to how he hesitated and how he repeated things, it did sound a bit mechanical and less conversational. See how the two influence each other. And then there were some words that were mispronounced um, where we lost some clarity. For example, he said whale, which is actually wild. And whale means crying, okay? Um, so we kind of lost the meaning there. And he said leisure instead of leisure. Um, lots, louts for lots. So there you go. Okay, but we mostly understood. Okay, now let's look at Alexandra. She's a typical seven. She's from Colombia. Let's see why she's a seven. So we've been talking about a well-known person that you like or admire, and I'd like to discuss with you one or two more general questions related to this. Let's consider, first of all, being in the public eye. Yeah. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of being famous? Uh, the advantages... Uh are that first that you will get really rich and the fame actually it helps you because you don't have to pay for a lot of stuff they will give you free dresses and free stays in the hotels free meals free everything so actually you're saving money plus the money that you're earning and the disadvantages are that being a public eye you lose your privacy you will always be in the eye of the paparazzi and the people and if someone recognizes you they will take a picture of you and that's the end of the relaxed evening so i think that there will be a really big disadvantage do you think if a celebrity accepts those endorsements do you think they they lose their honesty i don't think that they will lose their honesty but uh maybe it will change them they will have to accept the environment that they are living into right now. So if they get famous and they're not selling their soul to the devil, I don't think that they are that bad. I think that it's just human and if they like it, well, better for them. Can you talk about how the media reports on famous people in your country? Uh, the reports of the media in my country, they are like having half, half serious news and half entertainment. So the reports are um, often, but not that often. They don't have like uh, big news if Shakir gets married or not. It's like a small news, but it gets bigger with the people, not with the media, because people start to talking about the news, not the media makes it big. Do you think more time should be spent on current events and um, political news? I think so, but I think that we also need a rest from the serious stuff and we also need entertainment. So it will be a balance because only bad news is not good for anybody. So I think that health and health it will be better. Why do ordinary people find the lives of celebrities so interesting? I think because uh, if they see somebody that successful and rich uh, failed or getting uh, dumb or in jail, I think that we feel better about ourselves because we think, okay, we might not be rich, but we are better than them. So I think that's why we like it so much to see that kind of news. So you think most people want to see that celebrity fail? Maybe, or maybe it depends. If you don't like anybody, you will like them fail. But if you really support one person, you will like them <clears throat> to be like really successful. Let's talk about celebrity culture. How does the media use famous people in advertising? In a lot of ways, because if people follow one person, for example, Justin Bieber right now in the Super Bowl, uh, the media will use it and publicists will use him as long as 
it takes because if he's famous, the money return will be really high. Do you think people want to buy a product because the celebrity endorses that? It depends on the target, but uh, if it's a smart target, it won't be happen like this. But if it's like a child or um, teenagers, they will follow anything if their leaders does it. You mentioned uh, Justin Bieber. Um, are there any negative effects of young people becoming famous? Maybe not for the people that follows the famous people, but I think that it will be really bad for that poor guy. It's being famous at that young age, you don't know what is good and what is bad, and they will always turn bad. Thank you very much. Okay. This is the end of the speaking test. Okay. All right. Okay, let's see what is going on with Alexander. Now, her fluency and coherence was pretty all right, wasn't it? So she was quite fluent. Um, she gave us extended and appropriate answers. So, you know, we've got a lot of information there, which is good. Um, she used a good range of those markers and linking words. She said things like, actually I think so for example in a lot of ways um, now she did have some hesitation and when it comes to hesitation um, what's acceptable for a seven is if you hesitate you don't hesitate that much but you are looking for the English word so if you look at the seven under fluency and coherence um, it says in the second bullet point, at the second bullet point, may demonstrate language-related hesitation at times. And that means, you know, you, you um, are looking for the English words. Um, how do you really express this? But if you, um, for an eight, it's more about you don't quite know what to say about the issue because you don't know much about it the issue but if you can explain to us in English um, why you don't know much about it that's acceptable as well because remember this is not an IQ test we are testing whether you can express yourself in English how well you can so in whichever situation you find yourself in your new country will you how will you deal with these situations in English so with her with Alexander um, she did hesitate, but mainly when she was just trying to explain her ideas, and that's what you're going to expect sometimes. Lexical resource. Now, that is a main strength. She really had a good um, use of language. Um, she had a wide range. She used some less common and idiomatic and colloquial language, which she said, lose your privacy, selling their soul to the devil, um, getting dumped. That was pretty impressive. Um, and a very strong feature of those. Then grammatical range and accuracy. Um, so when we listen to Alexander, um, we could see that she used a good range of simple and complex structures. Um, she used them flexibly, and many of the sentences were error-free. But if you want an eight, the difference between what makes or breaks an eight um, and what gives you a seven is we don't want you to repeat the same grammar mistakes again and again. We don't want the issue to be systematic. So if I'm listening to you, for example, and I'm going, oh, you just broke a grammar rule. Okay, it's all right. It's okay. It's, uh, you can still have a nine. You're probably just nervous. Oh, you just broke the same grammar rule again. Okay, maybe an eight. <laughs> oh, hold on. You just broke the same grammar rule again for the third or fourth time. Maybe you don't know the rule, or um, maybe maybe you, you just have a bad habit there, but you, you keep making the same mistake again and again. Um, and in an eight, if you look at the second point on the grammar, um, it says in the longest bit of the second point, basic non-systematic errors. And Alexander, she did make some systematic errors um, with articles kept coming up, prepositions, subject verb agreement and verb tenses for example if someone recognize you it's actually if someone recognizes you if people follows if people follow 
um, you will like them fail. And it won't be happen like this. So, ooh, okay. So <laughs> that's not acceptable from eight, but she didn't make that many mistakes. So let's look at pronunciation. Um, look, she was clear and easy to follow. And the stress in intonation was nice. It was used well. It was very pleasant to listen to her, warm and friendly. Um, but she did have some problems with some sounds where she would say young instead of young. Um, but I could still understand it. You know, at least we could still understand her. Um, so a seven, a six is if you can show us that you're aware of the features. A seven is maybe all the good things from a six, but maybe two good things from a seven, uh, from an eight, and an eight is just all the good stuff from an eight. So yes, that's a seven. So in a seven, we want some good spoken English, but you're still allowed to make quite a few mistakes. You can still draw some attention to your mistakes. That's acceptable for a seven. Okay. Now, let's listen to our final um, test taker. That is Kush from India. And this would be a good example of a band eight. Now, we've been talking about a well-known person who you like or admire. And I'd like to discuss with you one or two more general questions related to this. Let's consider, first of all, being in the public eye famous people are watched by everybody what are yes. the advantages and disadvantages of that okay the advantages is uh, that a lot of people watching you so you become famous and uh, there are a lot of things which you can do correctly uh, and politically right uh, because uh, you know uh, there is media watching you and you can go ahead and pass the message to the media in a right way the disadvantage is uh, that uh, you have to be diplomatically correct. At times, if there are certain things which are incorrect, still you have to go ahead and do that, mm -hmm. which uh, doesn't make sense because there are a lot of political uh, leaders, they, they are into corruption uh, back in India. And uh, uh, well, uh, at times, yeah, there are some things which are wrong, but they have to do it. Why do they have to do it? Because there's a lot of political pressure and uh, if they don't do it, the political party would not support them and in the end they have to resign. Do you think the media plays a role in that? What is the media's approach to reporting uh, what famous people do? Well, media plays an important role. Uh, at times media will actually show things which are not correct or, uh, you know, if you see it, it looks like, yeah, he's wrong. but. That's not the case. So, uh, yeah, media plays a very important role. They portray in a wrong manner at times, and sometimes they do portray in a right manner. Can anything be done about that, do you think? Uh, well, uh, not really, because uh, to in, in today's world, what has happened is everything is communicated by media, television, news, internet. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you just have to go ahead and, you know, uh, probably call the media and do a meeting and answer questions uh, uh, to the public and give uh, justification and reasons. Very often the media reports on the most trivial things, in, yeah. in important issues, but people are fascinated by those things. Why are people fascinated by it? Because uh, these days people like to listen to gossip and uh, trivial things. They're not interested uh, in, in the bigger part, what's happening. Uh, they, they have a simple life. They would like to live it their way. They are not bothered what, what is happening within the country. The only few people you see are really interested in uh, knowing about the country and, you know, uh, getting all the information and reacting. Let's uh, go on and talk about this celebrity culture. How are famous people used by advertisers nowadays? Uh, well, uh, f famous people are uh, really used for advertising because one, they can pro uh, promote the product and two, there are a lot of fans, their fans. So obviously if they are using that product, what will happen is those fans will actually use uh, that product. And uh, of course, it's a money-making business. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if Mahatma Gandhi would a, a watch of swash, mm. oh, I would wa you would use, wear it. Yeah, I would wear it. I was like, oh, he wore it. I'll wear it. The use of famous people in uh, advertising and other things, do you think that has a negative effect, especially on young people? Uh, at times, yes. There are some of the advertisements which are not meant or not, uh, uh, you know, they, they are offensive to younger generations. So, uh, at times, yes. Do you think that famous people can influence public opinion beyond just selling things? They can make people vote differently or believe? Yes, they can. They influence a lot of people mm. today. Uh, even cricket cricketers or any kind of uh, famous personality, they influence uh, the public, uh, you know, to do things. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, I'm fine with that as long as, uh, I mean, at times I do like, but then at times I don't like, so I don't bother much. All right. Well, thanks, Kush. That's the end of the speaking test. Thank you. Um, now, let's see what's going on with Kush. Um, what was it band seven? Uh, eight. So she was very fluent and her detailed, uh, her responses were long and detailed. Her hesitations were not to look for language. It was more content related. She was more looking for, oh my goodness, what else can I say about this thing? Okay, so there's a big difference in that. And then um, she used fillers like, you know, I mean, natural linking words and markers. That's not the case. I'm fine with that. Yeah, that went well. Then we are looking at lexical resource, her vocabulary. She used a wide range of vocabulary, um, which she used flexibly and precisely. And she used good examples. She said um, political pressure into corruption, today's world, promote the product, product a money-making business. She did have some rare errors in word choice. For example, do a meeting that was a bit clumsy. Um, so little things like that could keep her from a band nine, but she didn't do it often enough to make her go to a band seven because a band eight is where you draw less attention to the mistakes you make and more attention to what you are saying. So um, you'll find that in Australia, for example, we want teachers and lawyers to get um, a band eight for the reason that they need to present to a class on a weekly basis or a portrait. And the last thing people want to focus on is the mistakes they're making when they're speaking. They want to focus on the content of the lesson being presented or the content of the case being presented. That's what an eight means. As I said before, seven can still draw attention to mistakes. That's okay. And that's more required for the medical industry because you don't care if your doctor makes grammar mistakes, but you care more whether your doctor understands you or the nurse or the psychiatrist or the social worker, wherever the public's mental or physical health is in, their ha in someone's hands, that's usually a seven. But this is more presentation style, an eight. Okay, so grammar. Now, um, she used a wide range of grammar structures accurately. And um, for example, she said, what will happen is those fans will actually use that product. And she did make some rare errors. The advantage is, is interested in the bigger part of what's happening, but she didn't repeat them that much. So they were quite rare, these errors. Um, as I said, it didn't draw much attention. Now, pronunciation. Because she was so fluent, um, her rhythm was great. Stress and intonation was great. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, and, and she um, used it well to reinforce meanings. Like, at times, I do like. And, you know, it's when you're going to, when you're going to storyteller mode, you know, when you, almost like you're reading a book to a child, when you are sharing something with someone, it's different from when, as opposed to just trying to get the speaking test over and then run, you know, hoping the examiner could work with that. Um, the best is to share because then you'll focus more on, on whether the person who's listening to you, which is the examiner, is getting the meaning instead of worrying so much about your own mistakes. 
it changes because you use your tone and your rhythm and the stress in a much more productive way. Okay, so she did have some minor problems with the word stress sometimes and the sound. Word stress is, for example, it's a beautiful, there's a beautiful, 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 that's word stress. But sometimes she mucked around with that a bit. And um, and the sound, like the or whatever, but not in um, so many times that it lost meaning. Okay, so um, now before we head to questions, just a bit of advice before we go. Remember to listen, read, and think in English before the test. It really helps. Okay, so listen to the radio. And if the radio is too depressing because it's too political or, or you know, talking about COVID or something all the time, then um, go to the radio's website, the ABC's website, and choose your interviews. I'm not endorsing anything anyone's saying. I'm just saying it's great to listen to conversational English or podcasts or TED Talks. Just remember that these people should be native speakers. Um, so, and read lifestyle articles. Don't just read formal things. Read lifestyle articles, well-written ones, magazines or um, anything like that. Talk at a steady rate. Don't go too fast or too slow. Use a preparation minute to make notes. So for part two, when you have a minute to prepare, nine out of 10 times when someone says, it's okay, I don't need this minute, and they want to start, they mess it up. It helps to have notes. I have notes. I'm using these presentation notes and my own little notes down here. Just so I can stay on track. Okay, use your noting time, your note taking time. Use natural fillers like, now let me think, to avoid pauses. Uh, avoid phrases such as, how do you say? That's not even a sentence. That's not even a sentence. Don't say, how do you say? And you'll pick this up the more you listen to conversational English like talk shows or radio interviews okay, so get on to those don't sound flat use your stress and intonation i don't want you to speak like this please tell us a story share us with share the story with us okay um don't worry about a grammar mistake just move on because more often than not you know you will probably if you're going to worry about your grammar mistake and you worry about it so much that it could affect your fluency and then affect your rhythm and all that. And you might hit a blank and forget what you wanted to say, which would affect me. It's not worth it. Don't worry about the grammar. Just go on. Okay, just move. This is a speaking test. We'll, we worry more about the grammar and writing anyway. Okay, so just, just speak. You can really put all your eggs in the basket of um, the other parts, not the grammar. Now, Masterclass, it's still study your grammar, but I mean, when you are doing speaking, don't get stuck on your mistakes. Remember to give more details about each of the points you make. Don't just go, yes, I like movies. Just tell us in the part one, yes, I like movies because they make me relaxed. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to sit there and go, why, why, why? Because we still have to fill the time. Explain your answers by giving reasons for what you say. Yeah, we want to know why. This is a conversational English test. Uh, we need to see if you can express yourself. Um, we need to see if you can deal with um, being an English-speaking country. Weigh up both sides of the question and give examples to support them, right? So especially in part three, people may like, especially if you speak generally, people may like candy, but I can see why there are those who don't. Um, I, you know, just, just give us all the options. Um, rehearse, work or study and um, where you live questions, but don't, you have to sound natural. If you, if you just rehearse it like a parrot, you will hear that and you won't sound natural. You still have to make it your own. All right. So um, give your opinion with, in my view, as far as I'm concerned, generally speaking, I'd say that those are great fillers as well. So you can see. And then practice typical IELTS topics of education, health and fitness, travel and transport, leisure. So just read widely. Read as widely as you can. Read about current issues. That's the only way to prepare. Don't try and go and find out what people are asking and try to get something somewhere that you shouldn't be getting. Um, just, just 
think broadly, okay, and read widely, and that would help you. Okay, so there you go. Oh my goodness, what did I just do? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just went into, okay, well, here we go. Um, this is me and my technology. Um, and I honestly don't really know how to get to the last one. But basically, I was going to say thank you very much for coming today. You have your masterclass packs and you can read as widely as you want. I'm just scooting through this now because I was trying to get to the end slide. So ignore what you're seeing um, for now. Um, but what I am going to say to you is thank you for coming. You can now, we're going to open the general questions. And remember, we have the services that we offer on, um, on coaching, which I do, you can present, uh, you can book it through IDP, and we also have coaching and writing and all that, so yes. Okay, Sam, over to you. We are ready to take questions. <laughs> Spectacular. We'll um, last slide. Amazing. You got through that really quickly. You got through all, all these little rehash of all the slides. I think that's really fun. <laughs> I'm just clicking away. It's great. Okay. Um, yeah, again, that was a spectacular webinar, Michelle. So thank you so much for all the brilliant insights and honestly, the incredible energy you bring um, and for having a two for two streak of excellent webinars hosted or run with IDP. So thank you so much. Um, we've had a lot of questions come in, uh, which I think a lot of them are very interesting. Uh, so I hope you're ready to give some answers. Michelle, are you sure. ready to have questions? Amazing. Yes, Sam, don't worry. <laughs> um, question one, how can I speak fluent English in public without uh, like fear or getting nervous? Do you have any advice for this? Okay, um, so if you want to speak in public, um, I remember when I was learning German, that's my third language, um, I used to get really, really nervous about learning German um, because I learned that in South Africa and I learned that in my English and Afrikaans school. And when I went to German for a month, it back in the 90s, people hardly spoke English in Germany. And I felt so embarrassed because everybody around me were native speakers. They spoke so fluently and so naturally. And I felt so broken in the way I spoke. But then people were very encouraging. They were very appreciative of me trying to speak that language. And I had no choice though. I, had, I really had to speak the language. And I thought I was doing terribly, but people liked me trying to speak their language. And obviously, a lot of people are too polite to help. They feel they'll be rude if they interrupt you. So they'll just appreciate you doing that. And when I went back to South Africa in my German class, they asked me, well, can you please tell us how was your trip? And when I started speaking in German, people's mouths dropped open. And they couldn't believe how fluent I was as opposed to before, you know, before I went. And I didn't realize that either until I... I spoke and the other students spoke as well. And I realized, oh my goodness, I've improved so much just by practicing the whole time. Um, but you don't realize it when you're between all the people who speak English every day. So don't go too hard on yourself. Be less harder and less judgmental on yourself. Um, and just use every opportunity you can because I promise you people appreciate that. If there are people who don't appreciate that, those are the people you shouldn't care much about, okay? And they're not, the majority of people appreciate it a lot. So just try, just, just know that you're doing something really admirable. That's really great advice. And I can tell you for a fact, there's multiple comments in the Zoom and the uh, Facebook Live saying they love your tone of voice and your accent oh, and your fluency. Thank you. Um, you've been very well received in all of those regards. Oh, that's good. Thank um, you. Excellent advice. Um, question two, I quite like this one. Uh, is it more important to have an interesting story or the ability to develop the topic by using a range of topic related vocabulary, um, even if it makes your story quite boring in speaking? Um, oh, okay. Are you, are you sad? Okay. Can you just, okay, I'm just yeah. trying to wrap my head around. So it's a long question. question. Uh, the yes. question is basically whether someone should have a really interesting story or they should use a lot of complex words, even if it makes their story quite boring, uh, which would be marked better. If you're going to use a lot of complex words, 
you're not going to sound very natural because you're going to overthink things and we will hear that. So first go for the story that's that's at your heart, right? Like um, that, that you feel from the heart. Um, that did you go, your gut feeling. Um, when you go, okay, I've got to share this thing with them because it will make you a great storyteller and your fluency would be woohoo and your... Um, you know, just, just to tone, everything would be great. And your pronunciation would probably benefit from that. And who knows what will happen with the grammar. The grammar is always a wild card, isn't it? So with lexical resource, of course, with the vocabulary, you'll be able to stick to the topic and, and you'll be able to um, give us, you know, we will know whether you can talk about familiar and unfamiliar topics. But don't panic too much because we, the test is not just two minutes long or just that, um, topics length we still going to talk to you afterwards whether you can to see if we can have that two-way conversation and you'll have plenty of opportunity to if you have listened to some expressions you liked or um, saw some in some lifestyle articles um, and have put you know you've put some of them in your pocket kind of to pull out later that's fine but you'll find that the more relaxed you are the more this will come to you. Don't focus too much on impressing us. Focus more on sharing with us. That's what we're looking for. We want to see if we can deal with things in this country. Um, and then those nicer, fancier words and things, they will, they will come. That's why I said try to practice in your everyday life as well. When we learn a language, um, we've got our left brain and right brain. And the left brain is more the logical side, the reason, reasoning side. And you basically use that for coherence, you know, to stick to the point and grammatical structures. That's where that's, that's the rest of language learning is on this side. Okay, my favorite side, the creative side, the musical side. This is the side that if you're completely stressed and you can't get into the flow, forget about it you'll probably stuff up half of your exam you, you you must that's why you must rather enjoy telling your story sharing your story than trying to focus on all because most of language is on this i know i'm expanding this in a very abstract way but it will benefit you if you focus more on going into the flow I think that was the perfect answer. I think you kept that really interesting and natural so. um, in the sense that you probably should for a speaking test answer, just straightforward, natural, interesting, um, natural. perfect answer. Um, I think this next question is a little bit more straightforward, I hope. Uh, am I allowed to go off topic in speaking part two or will I lose marks for this? Yeah. Um, so look, um, so you get your topic, right? And a question I get sometimes is, um, look, you've got to stay coherent. You've got to stick to the topic. You've got to make sure if you go off topic, you've got to explain to us why. We need to know why. So if you get a topic, for example, um, let's say you don't know what on earth, you don't really know where to go with this. So we say, can you tell us about a book you've read? This is my favorite example. So sorry if you've heard this before. Tell us about a book you've read that you would like to read again. Um, and you go, oh my goodness, I don't really read books, um, and you, but we can't change a topic. We've tested these topics on so many different people. Um, it's very general. You can do something with it. So if you go, okay, um, all right, so I don't read because my grandma used to chase me around the house and hit me over the head with a book. So if you see a book, you tremble. So um, you can either, you can do one of three things. The first option is the worst option and that's lying, okay? So um, that is basically just making up some story. But the problem is if we ask you follow up questions, more often than not, people just, the, the answers do not coincide. They, they just don't make sense when it comes to the actual story they told us. So we always say, look, you're really stressed. And now you want to remember this lie you just made up rather steer away from that because you know um so rather don't lie rather either go for option two or three so two you can just tell the absolute truth and that may mean if you have that card that we gave you to speak from because you'll have a, a topic with the bullet points then it may mean you may not be able to stick to all those bullet points and that is okay as long as you explain it so you will maybe go Okay, so you asked me to talk about a book I've read that I would like to read again. 
But to be honest with you, I don't read because when I see a book, I tremble. And then tell us why. Tell us about this grandmother that used to chase you around the house. Now, the problem with, so that means you will not, you'll probably not cover all those points, which is okay. In writing, it's super important, but we give you this um, speaking card to help you, to give you ideas, but we're not staring at the card. We know what the topic is, but we just want you, we want to see how will you deal with this topic. You're in this English speaking country, how will you deal with it? if people ask you things so if it's a an, um if you want to explain to us what the problem is there you can but the problem again with part two with the second option you can get emotional you can start crying it might be a traumatic story or very dark and then we are trained to deal with this um or the examiners are trained to deal with situations like that but you the test taker may not be trained to deal with this in a stressful situation and then you may not be able to continue your test so you may want to go for option three if that's the case and option three is sort of touch on a topic but then relate something else to it so you can go okay um i don't read because books freak me out i tremble when i see them and it's all my grandmother's fault i don't i can't go into it because then i won't be able to do the exam so what i will do for you is I'll tell you about a movie I've seen that's been based on the book that I would like to see again. And this movie is Harry Potter. And then we don't just start talking about the movie. At least tell us why you're doing this. So we have some context. But that means you probably won't follow the exact points. What book was it? When was it? First? But so you won't follow the exact points. That's, if, that's what I mean with, yes, you can steer away from it, but you must provide us with context this is a conversational test because if we go too far away and we figure we can sort of figure out it's a rehearsed topic here that you were trying to sort of squeeze out of this thing we will very you know you will meet your maker in part three because that's where we really test it in that way so just try to stay as honest as you can so Does honesty is the, the best policy Yes. And that, I think that answers the question perfectly. And um, honesty is always the best policy, I think, is important, especially for an IELTS test. Yes, um, yes. I think we have and two be questions. Private, as private as you want to be. Sorry, Sam. If you want to be private about certain things, you can, but please just give us some sort of context and still volunteer some sort of information then that's related to, you know, don't, if we ask you about birds, please don't go and talk about spaceships or, or um, something else, unless you can relate them. No. Yep. Yep. If someone could relate birds to spaceships, I'd be impressed. I think. <laughs> um, we have two questions left, if that's okay. Uh, this one should be quite straightforward, I think. Yeah. Um, are dress code and eye contact considered during the marking process? Okay. Well, um, look, we. how would you dress for, um, again, when I said this is an international test. So you want to think about What's appropriate for 16-year-olds to 90-year-olds? We don't, um, so we can't judge you on, on, on um, you know, dress code. This is not a dress test. Um, this is more about respect. But we, whether you come naked to the test, which they won't allow you to, but if you do, um, they'll, they'll, no one's going to say anything. We can't score you on that. It's not about that. We don't care what you look like. And um, eye contact does help with communication. So if you look this way and that way or whatever, unless you, um, you have sight issues, medically speaking, we understand why you can't look at us. But otherwise, it's actually part of um, communication. But if you have this tendency not to look at us, but you're making complete sense and your story makes you know we we can follow you okay and it's not distracting that's fine i guess you know um so it's more about your the way you use your english and the way you um the yes it's a standardized test it it's applied all over the world in the same way so you know some will some parts of the world that got different dress codes you can just wear your um you can go in bare feet, you know, with no shoes on, I guess, in some places, and 
Yes, it doesn't matter. And in some places, you know, you, you um, have to cover up more. In some places, you have to cover up less. It depends where you are. But that's not our job to judge you on any of that. <laughs> Perfect. It's how comfortable you are when you do the test. You don't want to sit there and try to make sure something is where it should be. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Now, imagine after all these Zoom calls over the years, like I'm used to seeing people like not quite looking at me, looking at a screen instead. I think that's changed eye contact forever. <laughs> it has. <laughs> I was trying to look at the little camera up there, yep. but I was so many other well. things happening. Um, last question for the night, this one. Um, we have a test taker whose test is first thing tomorrow morning. They want to know if you have any last minute tips for them on IELTS speaking. <laughs> yes. Um... So, look, um, just go in there, be a great storyteller, just, just stick to the point, um, and that's what we want. We, you know, that's, and you're allowed to take a bottle of water with you into the test room. I still believe that's okay in Melbourne as well, as long as you can close it. And when you take that in with you, pretend that's your beverage of choice at a dinner party and pretend you're at this dinner party. And that sort of helps you <laughs> to relax a bit more. And also don't be distracted by the way the examiner may look at you while you're speaking. As I mentioned before, we're not judging you. We are focusing, we're over-concentrating, right? So some of us don't have the best listening faces and we are never ever judging you. We're literally trying to look for the best parts of your language. So if you just, just be like a bird that's flying, if, if you do think, oh my goodness, I've just messed this part up. I've just, if a little rock comes your way and you're fluttering all over, just carry on flying, okay? Don't just give up and fall. Just go, okay, that was a little rock. I'm flying on, I'm going on. I, don't, I just want to stay in the air. Keep doing that. <laughs> Perfect advice. I think that's a really fun answer for the final yeah. question. Yeah, um, so. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. And we actually have some feedback here from, uh, I think it was Facebook that says, thank you so much. This was very useful. I was really nervous about the speaking test, but now I feel oh. very confident. So I think you've oh, just instilled so. um, many test takers with some confidence with this webinar. I we just want to see how you'll be in an everyday situation. This test is literally to see how will you deal with everyday situations in English? Because we want to make sure you'll be okay in your English speaking country. I mean, I'm from South Africa. We have 11 official languages there, right? And English is one of them. So these top five English speaking countries like Australia, New Zealand, UK, US, um, Canada, they don't look at our country like we're an English speaking country, really. They're going, oh, can I actually speak English there? Well, you know, am I going to faint when I speak, have to speak English in this different country? Um, so that's why we need to test so many different people in so many different scenarios just to see will you be okay you know will you be able to ask for help and get help in this country where you'll most likely be far away from family and friends um so this test is actually also to protect you not just the country great like advice that. to wrap up i think um that is all the questions we have time for tonight rochelle uh thank you so much for joining us to share your extensive knowledge and also for all the brilliant answers you provided over the last I think 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, a yeah. further thank you to everyone who tuned in uh, for being with us tonight and a huge shout out to our team uh, behind the scenes for making this all possible. Uh, if you're looking for more IELTS preparation material, make sure to head to our website, which is ielts.idp.com. Uh, and we also really recommend checking out our new Prepare Hub, which you can find on the website, um, as well as the webinar registration page, where you can register for more of our upcoming webinars. Uh, next fortnight, we'll be speaking with Rose from Macquarie University, who is an English, uh, experienced English language teacher uh, and IELTS preparation expert. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, additionally, we'd recommend checking out our social channels if you'd like day-to-day -day IELTS and English language updates and prep content, um, or just to have a chat to us personally where you can inquire about just general customer support things. Um, these channels are IELTS Essentials from IDP on Facebook, uh, IELTS.Essentials on Instagram, and IELTS by IDP on YouTube and also IELTS just at IELTS on TikTok. Um, that's it from me. And Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, true. <laughs> and the uh, progress checks as well. Yeah, no, progress checks is services. brilliant. There's mm. um, so many things available on the website. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Rochelle. Do you have any parting words at all? <laughs> um, no, just stay safe, everyone. And um, 
thank you for tuning in and we just hope you know we we basically just want to help you get through this so yeah good luck awesome thank you so much everyone have a wonderful evening have a wonderful evening rochelle <laughs> thank you sam bye, -bye.